In chapter 7, we will be looking at acid-base reactions of organic chemistry. As we said in the earlier lecture, this is one of the eight types of reactions that we will be looking at. So in this lecture, what we'll be doing is we'll define acids and bases. We'll have different definitions of acid and bases. And of course, we'll apply those definitions. Next, we'll look at acid-base equilibrium. Next, we'll look at the strengths of acids. So we know from experience that hydrochloric acid is a strong acid whereas acetic acid is a weak acid. In this lecture, we'll look at why one acid, such as HCl, is strong, and why the other acid, such as acetic acid, is weak. Next, we'll look at predicting acid strengths. If given an acid, can we tell if it's a strong acid or a weak acid? We'll look at that concept and its application. And lastly, we'll apply the concepts of acid and base reactions to different organic reactions that we will encounter in this course. First, <clears throat> let us define an acid and a base. We have two definitions. And the first is the Bronsted definition which, of course, I'm sure you have seen in your general chemistry course. The Bronsted acid is a proton donor. Notice here a proton donor. A proton is H+. It's hydrogen without its electrons. A Bronsted base is a proton acceptor. So that's the definition. Our job as chemists is to apply that definition to reactions. So here is a reactant, benzoic acid. Well, of course, the acid gives it away as an acid. And here is sodium hydroxide. The question now is, which is an acid and which is a base? If you look at this reaction, benzoic acid goes to the benzoic salt. So this hydrogen is gone in going from reactant to product. So that's giving up its proton, so therefore this is the acid. The other reactant, NaOH, OH, picks up this proton to form water, and here it is. So this is the base here because it accepted a proton. Let's look at another example hydrochloric acid. Here is the proton and it's gone from HCl in going from reactant to product. Water, in this case, picks up this proton here and here it is. So therefore, water, in this case, is a base. Let's look at another definition, <coughs> and this one is Lewis acid and Lewis bases. It was coined from the chemist G.N. Lewis, who worked at um, Berkeley some years ago. Lewis defined an acid as electron pair acceptor. So an acid is an electron pair. Notice two electrons. And of course, we know why because it takes two electrons to make a single bond. And a base is an electron pair donor. So it's giving up its electrons, and that's the Lewis base. Let's look at a, a couple examples here. BF3. As we said last lecture, boron here is sp2, which means it has a vacant, unhybridized p orbital, vacant, so it can accept electrons from an amine into, these, into this p orbital to form a new bond and, of course, a product. So in this case, the amine here with its electron pair is 
the donor, hence the base, and B of 3, which has a vacant orbital that can accept a pair of electrons, is the acid, or Lewis acid. Here's another example. This is a carbocation. Of course, as you know from last lecture or last chapter, a carbocation is an sp2 hybridized carbon with a vacant p orbital again can accept two electrons a pair of electrons chlorine or the chloride anion has six electrons or or, um, or eight electrons or four pairs so if one pair goes into the vacant p orbital of a carbocation this is the lowest base and this, of course, is the Lewis acid because it's an electron pair acceptor. And here is the product. So once again, you should be able to draw Lewis that structures and put in your non-bonding electrons because that will be your um, base. And that will be an indication of where the reaction site will occur. And of course, look out for vacant orbitals because that's where electrons go to form new bonds. Let us look here at equilibrium constants. Of course, as you know from Jen Kim, you mix an acid and a base. It's governed by an equilibrium constant to produce a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. If this K equilibrium here is large, a big number, it is a strong acid. It being the acid here, HA, is a strong acid. We'll see water quite a bit because all these measurements are done in water, or should we say relative to water. If KA is small or smaller than a larger number, it's saying that HA here is small. So if the equilibrium constant is smaller than a larger number, the acid here is much weaker than another acid that has a larger number. So you should be able to look at the equilibrium constant and tell if an acid in that equilibrium is strong or relatively weak. Okay, let's look here at an example. So here's HBr, hydrobromic acid, and HCN. It's measured in water, so that's constant. Here's the equilibrium constant. This is 10 to the 9. So look mostly at your exponent. <clears throat> because that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the number. So this is a very large number. And this number here for HCN is much smaller because it's 10 to the negative 10, a small number. So that's the equilibrium constant. So what this is telling us is that HBr is a strong acid and HCN is a weak acid based on these equilibrium values. Let's look at another concept that you learned in Gen Kim, and that is pKa. So remember, the pKa is the negative log of Ka or K equilibrium. We use K here, A here, because it's meant for the acidity. So here is the pKa of hydrobromic acid. And of course, that's the property that's measured. So that's um, from a table. And here is the pKa of HCN. So it implies, we know from the previous um, slide, that HBr is a stronger acid. Since pKa is a negative log of Ka, negative 9.0 implies that HBr is a strong acid. And positive 9.2, since it's the negative log of Ka, it's telling us that HCN is a weak acid. 
So again, you should be able to look at the equilibrium constant values and tell if an acid is strong or weak. And you should be able to look at the pKa values of different acids and tell if it's a strong acid or a weak acid. Let us look at another concept you did in Gen Kim, and that's conjugate acid-base pair. So a strong acid here reacts with water, the base, to give here a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. You learn in Gen Kim that a strong acid will give a weak conjugate base. So strong acid gives a weak conjugate base. A weak acid will give a stronger conjugate base. So don't forget that. Strong acid, weak conjugate base. Weak acid, strong conjugate base. The importance is that when we start doing reactions, some reactants will be like this in the conjugate base. And we need to know if it's a strong base or a weak base to carry out a specific reaction. So this concept is a very important concept which will be used later on when we start looking at reactions. So here's a summary of what we just discussed and this is in the form of the pKa table. So an acid, HA for example, its conjugate base is A I minus, pardon me, and the pKa value, which is a constant from a table, is minus neg negative point, is negative 9.5. So, let's look at, and no, let's two, take two acids, HI and HCl, which is a stronger acid and which is a stronger base. The stronger acid has the more negative pKa and the weaker acid has the more positive. So going in this direction here, it tells us that the acids get weaker, and going in this direction here, it tells us that the acids are stronger. Since we know that a strong acid gives a weak conjugate base, this conjugate base here of HI, which is I minus, is a weaker conjugate base than Cl minus because it's coming from a weaker acid. So, conclusion, I minus is a weaker conjugate base than Cl minus. Let's just quickly review that. Strong acid, weak conjugate base. Weaker acid, strong conjugate base. We know this is a strong acid because of the pKa value. We know this is a stronger acid because of the more negative pKa value. So, let's look at an application. Which of the following acids would have the strongest conjugate base? as a question that involves a lot of thinking. So make sure you understand the question. Which of the following acids, here, we, here are the acids, which of those acids would have the strongest conjugate base? So the thinking pattern here is the strongest conjugate base comes from the weaker acid and the weaker acid has the more positive pKa. So, let's examine these pKa's. This is 3, 20, very positive, th minus 13, strong acid, minus 3, strong acid, 13, a weak acid, but probably, but not as weak as this acid. So more than likely, this would probably be the one. So it's the weakest acid, which means that it would have the strongest conjugate base. And of course, that would be 
the answer that you would select. Okay, let's look at another concept here. And this is going to be very important when we start doing reactions. So we have an acid and we have a base. A reaction takes place to produce the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. The question is, without giving the equilibrium constant, is it possible to tell that the equilibrium lies to the right or to the left? So if you're doing a reaction and you want to get a lot of products, you want the equilibrium to lie to the right. Here's one indication. If you know the pKa of the acid and the pKa of the conjugate acid that it's reacting with, with the base, the more positive pKa, the, direction, the equilibrium will lie in that direction. So in other words, since this is negative 1.74 and this is negative 7, so this number is more positive than this number. Even though they're both negative, but one is more positive than the other. So the equilibrium, as you've seen here, is to the right. Very important concept because when we start doing reactions, we need to drive the equilibrium to the right to get a lot of product. So we need to select an appropriate acid to get that done. Here's another example. pKa here is 38 for ammonia. Notice ammonia here is NH3. So it's giving up one of these protons to become NH2 for the base. The conjugate acid of the base that it reacts with is methanol. pKa is 15.2. 38 is more positive than 15.2. So therefore the equilibrium here lies to the left. So in other words, if you're trying to get this reaction to work, you would not get a lot of product. You would not get a lot of product because the equilibrium is to the left. Let's look now at the factors that affect acid-base strengths. So, if you were not given the pKa table, is it possible to tell if you have two acids, which is a stronger acid than the other one? If you had a pKa table, you could just look at the pKa table, and of course the stronger acid would be more negative, and the weaker acid would be more positive. But let's assume that we do not have a pKa table and we're trying to predict the relative acidities here. So let's look at two acids, H, CH3, H, which is methane, and um, NH2H, which is ammonia. So here's the acidic hydrogen. If it gives that up, you get your conjugate base. If it gives up this proton here, or the ammonia gives up its proton, because it's a proton donor by definition of an acid, you get a conjugate base. Notice that this conjugate base here is negatively charged because it has lost its proton and these two electrons are still there, which are right here. So, because we have a conjugate base that has a negative charge that's on a carbon, we need to make a comparison with the negative charge on another atom, the nitrogen. We know from definition an electronegative atom is an atom that can accommodate or attract a negative charge. So if we know the relative difference in electronegativity between carbon and nitrogen, we can tell which atom can best accommodate that negative charge. So look at your periodic table and you'll see that nitrogen is to the right of carbon, which means that it is more electronegative than carbon, which implies that nitrogen can accommodate the negative charge much better than carbon. So therefore, this is 
a, uh, a, a weak conjugate base. And this is a strong acid, relatively speaking. Looking at carbon, carbon is less electronegative cannot accommodate the negative charge as well as nitrogen so therefore this is a strong conjugate base which makes this a weaker acid. So this is a weak acid and this is a stronger acid on a relative scale. So if you look at your, periodic, your um, pKa tables you'll see that the pKa of um, an alkane is about I don't know 50 and uh, for the ammonium, it's around 35, which confirms, again, that this is a weaker acid compared to ammonia, which is a stronger acid resulting in a more stable or a stronger conjugate base and a weaker conjugate base for ammonia. So that's way of predicting that based on the electronegativity of the atom bearing the negative charge. So pay special attention to that. Let's look at another way of predicting um, relative acidity. So let us assume that we have here methane again and we have here ethene and propyne or ethyne, pardon me, two carbons. So here is the acidic hydrogen, here's the acidic hydrogen, and here's the acidic hydrogen. If you remove that acidic hydrogen, you get, get it over here as H+, plus, a proton, proton donor. So what's left behind will be our electrons with a negative charge. What's left behind here is this species with a negative charge once the proton is gone. Same here, this proton is gone to give H plus and this carbon with a negative charge. You may recall when we did hybridized orbital, this carbon here is sp3, which means that it has 25% s characteristics. Let's go all the way down to here. This carbon is sp, which means that it has 50% s character. You may recall that s orbitals are close to the nucleus. The nucleus contains the protons. The nucleus contains the protons which are positive. So because we have a lot of S character here in the SP, this carbon can accommodate the negative charge much better than this SP3 carbon which just has 25% S characteristic or S character. So therefore this species here or this conjugate base is weak it is stable because it can accommodate the negative charge and this molecule here as a reactant is acidic. So in other words, this e equilibrium lies to the right giving up the proton strong acid. This equilibrium here lies to the left weak acid. It does not give up that proton readily because it does not form a stable conjugate base, a strong conjugate base. Of course here the double bond falls in the middle so you should be able to tell given an alkane, an alkyne, and an alkene which is the more acidic molecule. Make sure however that there is a proton that's bonded to the hydrogen, to the carbon. Make sure again that there is a hydrogen bonded to the carbon because by definition, Branstad definition, an acid is a proton donor, giving up H+. Let us look at another factor that can be used in predicting acidity, and that's resonance. Let us look at two molecules, phenol, here's the acidic hydrogen, 
So you'd give that up to form a proton. So here's minus proton. What's formed here is a conjugate base. The question now is, is it weak? What you'll notice is that I'm using weak and stable as synonyms. So weak conjugate base is also a stable conjugate base. So this base here that results, is it stable or is it weak? Yes, it is. Because this charge is delocalized, you can see here it's on the oxygen, here it's on the carbon, and here it's on another carbon, and here it's on another carbon. So that negative charge is delocalized. A charge that is delocalized by resonance is stable compared to a charge that's localized. So if you have phenol, you remove this proton here, you get this conjugate base, and this negative charge here is localized on the oxygen. So therefore, this conjugate base here is strong, not stable, which means that this acid here is a weak acid. We will not want to give up the proton easily because it does not form a stable conjugate base. Phenol here is a much stronger acid because it forms a stable, weaker conjugate base. So again, you should be able to look at resonance and determine if a conjugate base is weak or strong. So now you can see why in the previous chapters we had you draw resonance structures. Because by drawing resonance structures, you can tell if a conjugate base is weak, stable, or strong, not stable. Here's another example using resonance. So here is acetone, ketone. Here is three. Here are three hydrogens. At least there's one. Here is a, here are three hydrogens again. Reacting this with a base, you remove the hydrogen to form water. And what's formed here is the conjugate base of acetone. This conjugate base has a negative charge and it's delocalized from the carbon into the oxygen because there is delocalization, it is relatively stable. So this conjugate base of this acid is relatively stable due to resonance. So it's a weak conjugate base, which means that this hydrogen here, or one of those hydrogens, they are called the alpha hydrogen, alpha because it's the first carbon from the carbonyl, that is an acidic hydrogen. Okay, let's look at another aspect here in predicting um, relative acidity, and that's polarizability or atom size. Okay, let's look at this HI, of course, as we know from the pKa that we did earlier, is a strong acid. HCl is, of course, we know it's a strong acid, but it's not as strong as HI based on the pKa's. But let's say you did not know the pKa values and you asked out of HI and HCl, which is a stronger acid? Let's look at a factor here called the polarizability. So HI will give up H plus to water to form H3O plus, that's the conjugate acid, and the conjugate base of HI is I minus. Notice I minus with a negative charge. The conjugate base of HCl, after it has given up a proton to water to form H+, is Cl-. Notice it's Cl- with a negative charge. Look at your periodic table. You'll see that I is a much larger atom than Cl. 
So I is a much larger atom than C, which means that I being a much larger atom is more polarizable. It can accommodate a negative charge much better than Cl, which is much smaller. You may say, well, Cl is more electronegative, so why isn't HCl more acidic than Hi? Because Cl is more electronegative, it can accept the, a, a, the charge much better. But in this case, polarizability, or the size of the atom, plays a larger role in the stability of the charge compared to electronegativity. So that is why HI is a much stronger acid than HCl because the conjugate base is large and polarizable and can accommodate the negative charge much better than Cl which is smaller, less polarizable and cannot accommodate the negative charge as well as HI. So conclusion, you should be able to look at two acids, determine the conjugate base, and determine the size of the conjugate base based on the periodic table, and make a conclusion or prediction which acid should be the strongest acid. Let us look at another factor here, inductive effect, effect caused by induction. Let's see what that really means. So here we have acetic acid, here's the acidic hydrogen, so that's given up by definition, um, 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 Bronsted acid, proton donor, you have a conjugate base here, negative charge on the oxygen. Let's go all the way to the bottom, fluoroacetic acid. This has a fluorine, a very electronegative fluorine bonded to the alpha carbon. Here's the alpha carbon because that's the first carbon from the carbonyl group. So the conjugate base is this because it has given up its acidic proton here, hydrogen, as a proton. The question now is, out of this conjugate base and this conjugate base at the bottom, which is more stable? Let's look at the bottom first. This has a fluorine atom, very electronegative fluorine atom, close to the negative charge. Because fluorine, by definition, is the most electronegative atom, if it sees electrons, so to speak, Close to it, it will start pulling the electrons to it, giving some stability. Remember that an electrons don't want to be localized. So the moment we have a very electronegative atom close to a negative charge, it will present some stability. So this anion is more stable than the top anion, which does not have an electronegative atom close to the negative charge. So you can rationalize now why the, this trend, bromine is um, electronegative and likewise chlorine is electronegative. So we would expect here um, chlorine and bromine to be um, um, the, 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 the acidity here to be different. By the way, I just noticed that bromine, this should be reversed. I'll reverse that on the, on the PowerPoint slides that I'll send to you because, no it's not, it's correct because fluorine is electron, most electronegative, chlorine is the next electronegative and bromine is least electronegative and of course we have hydrogen here. So this is correct, pardon me. Let's look at another trend here, and that's still the inductive effect. But let's see if we move the electronegative atom further from the conjugate base. So if we remove this H here, we get the conjugate base with a negative charge. So you have to do a lot of visualization here. As we pointed out earlier, you will have to visualize these molecules and perform different uh, 
um, reactions and, and manipulations with these molecules in your head. So just imagine removing this H here to create the anion, and here's the electronegative atom close to it. So the question now is, the conjugate base of this acid compared to the conjugate base of this acid, which is stronger? which is a weaker conjugate base. So let me say that again. So the conjugate base of this acid versus the conjugate base of this acid, which is a more stable conjugate base. This fluorine is closer to the negative charge of the conjugate base here, so therefore you would expect that to be a stable, weaker conjugate base implying that this acid is a stronger acid. Looking at the conjugate base of this acid, the negative charge would be here, as you can imagine. The fluorine is much further. Its effect is not as dramatic as it being closer. So therefore, this conjugate base here is stronger, which means that this conjugate acid is a weaker acid. Conclusion. The acid that has electronegative atoms close to the conjugate base site is a weaker, is a stronger acid compared to an acid where the electronegative atom is further from the reaction site. So applying that here, look at this fluorine, much further from the oxygen compared to this chlorine, which is much closer to the oxygen. So therefore, this is a stronger acid, and this is a weaker acid. The implication is that since this is a stronger acid, its conjugate base is weaker. Since this is a weaker acid, its conjugate base is stronger. Getting back to that concept of strong acid-base equilibrium. Strong acid, weak, weak conjugate base. Weak acid, strong conjugate base. So let us apply what we've just learned. Which of the following trends is the correct trend for the relative strengths of substituted acetic acid? Basically what we just did. So in other words, we need the strongest acid first. So here's the acid. An acid, an acid, and an acid. Notice for this acid, however, it has three fluorine atoms bonded to this carbon. Three fluorine, three very electronegative fluorine atoms, which would imply to me that these three fluorine atoms are doing a dramatic job of stabilizing the negative charge of the conjugate base. So I would assume that this can be a very strong acid. So this trend will not apply. This has one fluorine atom. This has none. This has one fluorine atom, but here's three. So this is a possibility. This one has two. This one has one. And this has none, just hydrogen. So I would assume that the E or a good conclusion, based on what we just studied, a good conclusion is that CF3 is the strongest acid, and CH3, COOH, is the weakest acid. So let's see what our answer is. And of course, here we have here the last as the possible choice. So for questions like these that you will see on the quiz and the test, the multiple choice questions, you will have to analyze them carefully look carefully at what's being asked, the strongest acid. Um, so the following trend, which is the strongest acid, and then you apply that to solving the um, problem. So let us look here at the application. So as we go along in our organic chemistry course, we will have to select different bases and different acids that can react to give us the desired product. So you have a lot of flexibility here.
So um, you have choices in the reagents that you can pick. So some of the strong bases that are used in organic chemistry are shown here. Carbon is bonded to magnesium. So you can expect that this carbon is very um, electronegative because carbon is more electronegative than magnesium. So this is a strong base here. Another strong base is the amide, sodium amide, NH2, because its conjugate acid is NH3. By the way, this conjugate acid of this molecule is an alkane, CH3, CH3, which of course, as you know, is a very, very weak acid. So this is a very, very strong base. Another strong base. Another strong base, sodium hydride, because the conjugate acid of H- is hydrogen gas. As you can tell, that's a very, very weak acid, so its conjugate base H- is pretty strong. Here's another example. Methoxide, sodium methoxide. The conjugate acid of this is methanol. Of course, as you know, methanol is a very weak acid, so therefore its conjugate base is very strong. This conjugate base here is not as strong as over here. So look at your periodic table and you can get a good idea of which is the strongest conjugate base. So let us say you went in the lab and your first job is to deprotonate this molecule. Take off this hydrogen as a proton. Notice it's an alpha carbon, so it's an alpha hydrogen, so it's relatively acidic. So the question is, what base will you use to take off that proton so you get this as your product? You drive the equilibrium to the right. You need a very strong base because the pKa of that proton is 19, the pKa of methanol is 16, which means that this is a strong base. So this can drive this over here to the right. If you went in the lab and you took ammonia as a base, the pKa of well, the conjugate acid of ammonia is the NH4. I don't have the value here, but it is a weak base and cannot pull that proton off, or not as likely to pull that proton off as this strong base. So you can see where we're going with this as we proceed in our course in organic chemistry. You can use any one of these bases to take off this hydrogen. You have a choice. And I'm hoping that students will give us a choice here instead of memorizing that this is the only base that can be used. What you should realize, however, that you need a strong base to pull this off and not a weak base to pull that off. Okay, so this is a classic example of the utilization of um, acid-base trends as we proceed in different reactions. So that's the last slide of this um, PowerPoint um, presentation for chapter 7. So go ahead and read up on the chapter. Um, I'll post the PowerPoints on, on the um, D2L and of course the lecture because you're seeing it now. Um, so continue studying as you read along in your textbook. Your quiz on Thursday will contain some of this material, but your exam for sure, which is the following week, will contain more of the material from Chapter 7. So once again, continue to study hard and um, make sure that you understand the concept as they are being presented. But equally important, make sure you can apply the concept to solving different problems. Okay? Continue to study hard. Okay? Bye.